Trump doesn't have it. He needs to come up with it by March 25th. Today, he told Judge Arthur Angeron, who ruled against him in the New York State civil fraud trial, today he said, Judge, I don't have the money, and nobody will lend it to me. Do you have it? Do you understand, MAGA morons? Do you finally understand? He doesn't have $500 million, which means he can't pay the fine leveled against him for defrauding lenders. He also doesn't have $500 million in assets to put up as collateral for someone to lend him half a billion dollars. Can you get that through your concrete skull, you MAGA morons? Donald Trump, your hero, is the opposite of a successful businessman. He is a successful con artist, one of the all-time greats. But next Monday, New York State Attorney General Letitia James comes with the padlocks and seizes all his properties and starts unwinding Trump's entire criminal enterprise. She's going to start off by selling 40 Wall Street and then Trump Tower in New York City to try and come up with half a billion dollars. She plans to dismantle the entire Trump organization by hosting a liquidation sale. Trump Tower will be for sale starting next Monday, which means poor Melania will have no place to live. We are about to find out just how leveraged Donald Trump and his company actually are. How many outstanding loans? How many liens? We're going to discover just how broke Donald Trump truly is. So, between now and Monday, will Donald Trump declare bankruptcy? He's done it six times before. Bankruptcy means he doesn't have to pay back his creditors. But what about the Russian mob he owes money to? Bankruptcy court will not protect Donald Trump from those types of creditors. Donald Trump has to win the election in November. That's just to stay out of prison. Although, given that all his assets are about to be vaporized, perhaps prison may end up being the safest place for Donald Trump because the Russian mafia wants its money. But then again, sadly, I love saying all this, I don't believe a single word. I don't believe this is ever going to happen. Because just when you think we got him, just when you think Donald Trump is cornered, he finds a way to escape. Last week, Chubb Insurance posted the $90 million bond for Trump's judgment in the E. Jean Carroll trial. The CEO of Chubb, Evan Greenberg, was an advisor inside the Trump White House. However, when it came to poning up nearly half a billion dollars for this New York State civil fraud judgment, Greenberg said, Chubb can't risk it. He's too big a risk. Trump reached out to 30 companies. They all turned him down. They all said, nope, we're not going to post a bond for you. But he still has six days to find that half a billion dollars. A lot can and will happen between now and then. And as much as I want to believe this is it, we know, we know somebody at the last minute will find half a billion dollars for Donald Trump. It will be flagrantly, in your face, illegal, most definitely a foreign actor, It will be a crooked deal that stinks to high heaven, just like Jared, just like his deal with Saudi Arabia. It'll stink to high heaven. It'll be illegal. People will call for congressional investigations. But Donald Trump, I believe, by next Monday, will live to fight another day. He always does. But 
as of this moment, take solace in the fact the entire world knows for a fact that Donald Trump is flat broke. The entire world, except his MAGA morons, they won't acknowledge this. And however he secures that half a billion dollar bond, it will once again cast an inky black cloud over his presidential campaign. We'll want to know what deal did he make? What did he promise to get that half a billion dollars? And how does he repay it if, God forbid, he ends up back inside the Oval Office. I'll have much more on this, much, much more later on in the show. We have a poll in our chat room. If you're watching me live on YouTube, thank you. And we have a poll. Do you think Donald Trump will come up with half a billion dollars by next Monday? I think he will. I hope he doesn't. That's the question I'm asking Please answer uh, the poll, and we'll have the results at the end of the show. But first, this is the mop-up for March 19th, 2024. I'm David Feldman in New York City. Thank you for finding me. I picked the perfect time to come back from my week off. Thank you for all your comments. Encourage me to take a week off. So some of you told me to take the entire decade off, but I did touch some trees. I, I, I saw some nature, and I feel a little better, a little better. The Washington Post reports this morning that in the waning days of his presidency, Donald Trump offered clemency to at least five health care professionals who were convicted of filing false claims with Medicare and Medicaid, In total, all five of them uh, defrauded Medicaid and Medicare to the tune of nearly $1.5 billion. One of the recipients of Trump's clemency, Philip Esformes, was convicted for masterminding the largest health care ripoff ever prosecuted by the Justice Department. The previous holder of that record was Florida Senator Rick Scott, who ripped off Medicare and Medicaid to the tune of $1 billion at least. His company paid a fine. He didn't, and he didn't go to prison. Instead, he got elected governor of Florida and is now running for re-election as the Republican senator from Florida. That is Rick Scott, the senator from Florida. So, Trump offered clemency and pardoned a lot of people. Why is this important? Because Medicaid and Medicare are sacred. It's hard to imagine a white collar crime more heinous than ripping off government agencies that provide health care to our elderly and our neediest. It's not just a white collar crime. It is a violent crime ripping off Medicare and Medicaid because it weakens our social safety net, leaving less, less medical care for those who need it. You're literally killing people by stealing from Medicare and Medicaid. And this is relevant because during an interview on CNBC, Donald Trump said, I'd be willing to cut Medicaid, Social Security, and Medicare to balance the federal budget. Now, of course, Trump later walked those comments back, but that's what he does. According to CNN, throughout his presidency, Trump's budget proposals always included cuts to Social Security, specifically disability benefits. His budget proposals always included cuts to Medicare and Medicaid, but he was always unable to get Congress to sign on to those cuts. This is all part of Trump's MO. When he talks to voters, he says he's going to fight to protect Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security. But when he appears on a business channel like CNBC, talking to donors, talking to Wall Street, he promises the investor class, 
I'm going to cut all those programs. And the thing with Trump supporters is, no matter what the socioeconomic background, they hear what they want to hear. The rich, the investor class, they hear that he's cutting entitlements. The middle class hears that he's protecting them. But the truth is, every year of his presidency, Donald Trump tried to pay for those tax cuts for the richest 1% by trying to cut our social safety nut, Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security. Not only that, in the waiting days of his presidency, he was more than happy to deal get-out-of-jail-free cards to half a dozen men and women who use Medicare and Medicaid as their personal ATM machines. Because to Trump, that's not fraud. That's good business sense. Told that Trump was once again proposing cuts to Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security, President Biden shouted, not on my watch. So let's, I'm going to get to Trump's real estate problems in a little while. But first, let's address how Biden plans to protect Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security. Work on the federal budget begins this time of year. Budgets come out of the House of Representatives. But the first step is for the president to offer a budget proposal that serves as guidance, especially for members of his own party working inside the House and Senate. Now, remember, we still don't have a 2024 budget, and a partial shutdown could come as early as this Friday. The fiscal year started last October. Again, we don't have a budget for 2024, and the government is operating on a series of continuing resolutions, one of which expires on Friday. But Biden, he's sticking to the clock, and he unveiled his budget proposal for 2025. The president is asking for a $4.7 billion emergency fund that the Department of Homeland Security would have at its disposal for hiring more people when there's a surge of migrants at the border. Last month, Donald Trump ordered Republicans to kill a similar supplemental that would have provided $13.6 billion to beef up border security. Biden also proposed a 25% across-the-board tax on billionaires, and he wants to raise taxes on corporations. The White House said just those two proposals alone would, within the next decade, hack $3 trillion off our federal deficit. Selling the proposal... Biden aimed fire at Donald Trump's tax cuts for the richest 1%, which, as we all know, tacked on nearly $8 trillion to our national debt. Yet there has never been talk since he took the White House. Biden has never talked of rescinding those tax cuts that Trump passed. And those tax cuts, however, are due to expire on their own in 2025, Biden, to his credit, has promised when reelected, he will allow the Trump tax cuts for the wealthiest uh, 1%. He will allow those tax cuts to expire. But the Democrats could have gotten rid of them uh, when Biden first took office. The president also proposed increasing Medicare taxes on individuals earning more than $400,000 a year. Biden's budget proposal would give Medicare the authority to negotiate the price of 500 drugs with Big Pharma, which he says would save $200 billion over the next decade. See, that's the difference between Biden and Trump. Trump's answer for protecting Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid is lying to voters, saying, I won't touch it, but every year of his presidency, Donald Trump tried to cut spending on all three. 
Joe Biden's solution? Start making the richest 1% pay the full freight just like the rest of us. Well, Tuesday is election day in Ohio where Republican voters pick a candidate to take on incumbent Democratic Senator Sherrod Brown, who is seeking his fourth term. Donald Trump supports Bernie Moreno in this race. He's a Republican. There's a Republican primary, and Donald Trump supports Bernie Moreno, who has never run for political office before, but he owned a successful car dealership, which is more than we can say about Donald Trump. So I guess by Trump's standards, Bernie Moreno is qualified to be a United States senator, but Republican Governor Mike DeWine, along with former Ohio Senator Bob Portman, support the owner of the Cleveland Guardians baseball team. He would be Ohio State Senator Matt Dolan. He owns the Cleveland Guardians, and he's also an Ohio State Senator. This race is tight, and we should pay attention to it on Tuesday. It's a gauge on who holds the power in the state of Ohio, at least among Republicans. If Moreno wins, then all signs point to Trump. If Dolan wins, then all signs point to the old guard Republicans, the more traditional pre-MAGA type of conservatives, like the Governor Mike DeWine. He would have the power in the Republican Party. But today's race is tight. It took an interesting turn when Bernie Moreno solidly anti-LGBTQ bona fides were called into question when the Associated Press ran a story suggesting that Moreno once posted a request for a hookup on a gay dating site while he was married. Moreno denies that he is or ever was gay and still hates homosexuals. Sure. Meanwhile, campaigning in Ohio, Donald Trump lashed out at Republican State Senator Dolan, reminding voters that Dolan was a Democrat 30 years ago. And even worse, said Trump, he caved into pressure from the politically correct radical left and changed the name of his baseball team from the Cleveland Indians to the Cleveland Guardians. Trump said, and I'm not making this up, Any man who allows himself to be pushed around by left-wing lunatics and surrenders the name Indians isn't qualified to be a United States senator. Glad to see this is going to be an election about the issues. So where does this leave Democratic Senator Sherrod Brown? Ohio once a swing state, has become reliably red in presidential elections. Ohio Republicans also have a trifecta, controlling not just the governor's office, but strong majorities in both the state Senate and the state Assembly. Sherrod Brown told CNN, however, that he believes Ohio is still a swing state, even though Trump won it in 2016 and 2020. Democratic Senator Sherrod Brown was first elected to the Senate back in 2006, beating a two-term Republican incumbent by 12 percentage points in a blue wave election that awarded Nancy Pelosi the Speaker's gavel in the House. Now, nearly two decades later, the question is, can Senator Brown, a Democrat, keep his seat in November in a state that's getting increasingly conservative. Remember, in 2022, the odious J.D. Vance, Republican, won a Senate seat from Ohio. Now, Senator Brown is a proud liberal who opposes any free trade deals that jeopardize the manufacturing base in Ohio. As a congressman, he courageously voted against authorizing the war in Iraq, and he also voted against the Defense of Marriage Act, 
which was signed into law back in 1996 by then President Bill Clinton. The Defense of Marriage Act prevented the federal government from providing benefits to same-sex couples. Thankfully, that law was later overturned by the Supreme Court about a decade ago when it legalized same-sex marriage. <clears throat> Occasionally, the court is capable of doing the right thing. So, the race in Ohio today is the one to watch, or the race Tuesday is the one to watch. And the question Democrats need to ask is, who do you prefer on the ballot running against Senator Brown in November? Do you want, if you're trying to, win in November, who do you want? Do you want the old guard Republican state senator, Matt Dolan, who is endorsed by the Republican governor, Mike DeWine? Or do you want Bernie Moreno, who is endorsed by Donald Trump? What's better? What outcome would be better for Senator Brown? A victory for Moreno today would signal Trump's complete transformation of the Republican Party in Ohio. He will have turned it into an extension of MAGA. A victory for Dolan, however, suggests that on the state level, Trump is still getting resistance from the old guard. What do you think bodes better for Democrats in November? If Trump owns the party completely, does that mean it will be destroyed come November because we all know everything Trump touches turns to crap. And if so, what would destruction of the Republican Party look like? If he, God forbid, wins, uh, he will uh, not destroy the Republican Party. He will have reshaped it. But if he loses, the Republican Party is then destroyed. So how, what is that going to look like? Former Vice President Mike Pence surprised everyone by announcing he will not be voting for Donald Trump in November. This is really interesting. It's, you know, during normal election cycles, this would be the number one story. Pence said Trump doesn't hold his strong conservative values. That, of course, in Trump try to have him killed. Pence's brother is a first-term member of Congress representing Indiana, and he announced he won't be running for re-election. Former Arkansas governor and failed candidate for the 2024 Republican nomination, Asa Hutchinson, wrote in USA Today on Monday that he will not be voting for Donald Trump come November. Hutchinson said he voted for Trump in 2016 and 2020, but not this time. Interestingly enough, I'm going to talk about this more in a second, Hutchinson added he will not vote for Joe Biden. Okay. Former New Jersey Governor Chris Christie, who also dropped out of the race for the GOP nomination, said from the very beginning that he wouldn't vote for Donald Trump in 2024. But he's never said whether he'd vote for Joe Biden. He also said he was never given a loyalty pledge to sign, even though the official policy for the Republican Party was you cannot participate in the debates unless you promise to support whoever ended up as the nominee. We now know that Liz Cheney says she will not vote for Trump. She hasn't really endorsed Joe Biden, although you get a sense she's going to vote for him, I think. Uh, but she hasn't officially endorsed Joe Biden, even though on Monday Donald Trump promised yet again to lock Liz Cheney up for participating in the January 6th investigation. She is no longer serving in the House. If you remember, she lost her seat in 2022 to this Republican challenger and Miskite, Harriet Hagman. That is 
Harriet Hagman. Uh, she is what Max Factor would call a forbissina punum, Harriet Hagman. Adam Kinzinger, the former Republican congressman who served on the January, <laughs> January 6th committee, uh, he decided not to run for re-election in 2022 because he was being primary challenged because he participated in the committee. He has made it clear that he will not vote for Donald Trump. So far, Hickey Haley, uh, I'm sorry, Nikki Haley, so far Nikki Haley has refused to endorse Donald Trump. In the hours right before losing to him on Super Tuesday and then dropping out, hours before Haley finally found her voice, calling Trump unhinged and unfit to serve another term as president. It was too late. It was really two days before Super Tuesday she began talking this way. Will Nikki Haley endorse Donald Trump? Probably, but she raised a lot of money challenging him. Maybe she figures there's a way to keep the scam going by delaying her endorsement. I would be shocked if she didn't endorse Donald Trump. We saw the emergence of never Trumpers going all the way back to 2016, but it really came to fruition in 2020. There's Bill Kristol who gave us the war in Iraq and he should burn in hell for that, but he's a never Trumper. There's Joe Walsh, Congressman Joe Walsh. There's George Conway, Kellyanne's ex-husband. There's former speaker John Boehner who uh, never had a glass of wine not in his hand. And of course, there's the Lincoln Project. But as Trump's criminality has now become even more manifest, as his threats to political opponents, as well as judges, prosecutors, witnesses, and jurors grow even more menacing, what will this new band, this new crop of never Trumpers coalesce into? How brave are they willing to be? How, or how many Republicans will revert to the norm? They'll suppress their contempt for Trump the man so they can support Trump the conservative. That's how Mitch McConnell was able to square that circle and endorse a candidate, Donald Trump, who attacks his wife nonstop, and who McConnell himself blamed for January 6th. But Mitch McConnell endorsed Donald Trump. Heading into November, what will these Republicans of conscience, if there is such a thing, do? Now, it's a given that Nikki Haley will come around and support Trump. But is it? Are there enough old guard Republicans willing to come out of the woodwork and say, we have to lose in November in order to save our party? That would mean if they were willing to sacrifice the Oval Office in November, that would mean for these Republicans that Biden would get to pick the court for the next four years that was a bridge too far for McConnell. That's why McConnell still endorsed Trump. It would mean expanding the social safety net, taxing billionaires, reining in corporations through stricter enforcement of antitrust laws. Are old guard Republicans willing to go along with all of this for the next four years to keep Trump out of office? I don't think so. It seems to me old guard Republicans endorsing Joe Biden is out of the question. That being said, one of Joe Biden's strengths is he depends on others. In fact, it's his greatest strength is he depends on others, especially when he's not coming from a position of strength. You know, Bernie was a revolution. 
he didn't need anyone. And in many ways, I think that's why he failed to get nominated. But, and of course, what he stood for, that was unacceptable in a Democratic Party controlled by neoliberals. Joe Biden is all about alliances. That's how he got the nomination in 2020. And it was from a position of weakness. He was weak right before he got the nomination. He depends on others. It's how he's passed more significant legislation than any president since Johnson. He knows I can't do it alone. That's his secret weapon, depending on others, openly admitting I need others. You know, Obama was a loner. Biden is not. Joe Biden was the last one to leave the room after his State of the Union. So, okay, let's catastrophize. If it starts looking really bad for Biden in the lead up to the Democratic Convention, is it conceivable that he would ask old guard Republicans for help? As, as Trump gets worse, as his rhetoric and threats get worse, I, and if somehow Joe Biden's numbers don't start going up, is it, con- <coughs> excuse me, is it conceivable that Joe Biden is going to do what he's best at, asking for help, asking Republicans for help? What kind of deal could he strike? Well, here are two unlikely scenarios. Then I'll present a slightly more likely one, but probably equally unlikely. Okay. We all know poll numbers are meaningless, but we also know they're not. Polls get it wrong all the time, and... I don't believe polls reflect the currents. I believe they reflect the winds. Currents don't shift. Winds do. Biden's currents are strong, but the wind is not at his back right now. And you do need to pay attention to the winds. Uh, Biden right now looks okay if you're an optimist if you're if you're looking at the polls which are the winds and you choose to be an optimist and you look at all this cash especially since the state of the union that he's raising uh he's doing okay but he looks very weak in key battleground states and i'm not saying he looks weak because the polls are telling me that which The polls are telling me that, but I'm not saying he's weak in Michigan, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin uh, because of the polls, but the polls are not great there. I'm saying he's weak in Michigan, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin because the rising tide of Bidenomics has not lifted all boats, certainly not equally. Nationally, Joe Biden's job numbers, his inflation numbers, the entire Biden economy is a record-smashing success, but not in the three states he needs to win. Pennsylvania, Michigan, especially Michigan, it's not doing great, and especially Wisconsin. These aren't polls. This is raw economic data, according to Bloomberg. So as we head into the summer, and if it looks like Biden can't win those three states, uh, I figure there are two unlikely scenarios, but we might as well knock them off. The most unlikely scenario is Liz Cheney, Kinzinger, maybe George W. Bush, Dick Cheney, Jeb Bush, and a lot of old-line Republicans flat out endorsed Joe Biden for the good 
of the country. It's never going to happen. Another unlikely scenario, but a more reasonable one, would be silence from the old guard. Silence from Republicans with a conscience. <clears throat> that would be where they say they're not voting for Trump, but they're not going to say who they're voting for. And we just heard that from Asa Hutchinson. In fact, he said he's not voting for Biden. He said, I'm not voting for Trump, but I'm also not voting for Biden. I can imagine that coming from Chris Christie and a slew of other mainstream Republicans who don't hold elective office. But no Republican serving in the Senate or the House or even in state government would dare to not offer a full-throated endorsement of Donald Trump. So those are the two unlikely scenarios. I figured I'd just bring them up and dismiss them. Here is a, a third scenario, which is unlikely, but a little more likely than what I just talked about. But this is never going to happen. A third party ticket. I mean, you see no labels is failing. They can't get one together. Uh, a third party ticket. I don't think Nikki Haley has that in her. But a third party ticket of perhaps Liz Cheney and maybe Chris Christie, they, tra they would travel. This is not going to happen, by the way. But they would travel the country campaigning for Republicans. They would run, be running for president, but the real campaign would be for Republicans to keep the House and take the Senate. And they, they would be running on divided government. They would not be betraying the Republican Party. They would be running, telling voters, say yes to Republicans, controlling the House and the Senate, but no to Trump in the White House. There's one little problem with that. Liz Cheney despises Mike Johnson and, and says he's unfit for, for office because he's a supplicant to Donald Trump. But that would be, it's not going to happen, but it would be a way for Republicans uh, to vote in November without having to vote for Trump. It's a way of getting out the conservative vote uh, so they vote f for down-ballot Republicans. Again, never going to happen, uh, especially since no candidate for Senate or the House would be caught dead with any of these third-party candidates. They're, they're too frightened of Trump to... Uh, accept an endorsement from Liz Cheney or Chris Christie. So, what do I think is going to happen? At this point, it looks like Trump's takeover of the entire Republican Party is inevitable and will be complete by the time they get to Milwaukee for the convention. By the summer... He will own this party, and that means owning Republicans in the House and the Senate. And uh, that kind of power trickles down to the state level. I think old guard Republicans will get in line, more so than they got in line four years ago. This is the way fascism works. Uh, you know, politicians in and out of office operate out of fear. They fear losing power and influence. A lot of these uh, politicians who are, no, who are no longer in office become lobbyists. They like their calls answered. There's a lot of power that Trump has uh, once he owns the Republican Party. And Trump knows that. And if Moreno wins in Ohio on Tuesday... You can be certain that Ohio Governor DeWine and his candidate, Dolan, they will all get in line. They will endorse Moreno, and they will endorse Trump. This is the way it works. They get in line. They always do. Remember Lindsey Graham 
Remember him back in 2016? He ran for president against Trump, called him a fraud. Trump attacked Lindsay's best friend, John McCain. Uh, but come November of 2016, Graham couldn't wait to be Donald Trump's towel boy. They get in line. And then the question is, will Trump win in November? Now, if he loses, the Republican Party has been destroyed. If he wins in November, what will resistance look like? Hitler died when he was 56. Trump is 20 years older than Hitler was when he died. So Trump could end up back in the Oval Office. How much strength, physical strength, does he have left? Plus, he is clinically insane. Look, I can't say I don't marvel at the dark forces Trump has marshaled to postpone and delay his criminal trials. He's doing it in, in Fulton County. Fonnie Willis wins the judgment, and yesterday his lawyers said they want to appeal Judge McAfee's ruling on Fonnie Willis. He's able to delay, delay these criminal trials, and it's remarkable. He, you know, and at the same time, he's able to maintain his political base and power in the Republican controlled House. He's calling the shots with Mike Johnson. It's remarkable. But in the end, Trump is crazy and stupid. In the end, if he gets back into the Oval Office, he can only surround himself with people who are even crazier and even more stupid than Donald Trump is. And yes, that's possible. It's possible to find people even crazier and dumber than Donald Trump. For example, Paul Manafort is being brought back into the Trump fold. Yes, that Paul Manafort, he of the $15,000 ostrich jacket. Remember Paul Manafort? He was one of Trump's first campaign chairmen. On December 23rd, 2020, Donald Trump, on his way out, issued a full pardon for Paul Manafort. Before that, pardon, Manafort was serving time for witness tampering and, among other things, conspiracy to defraud the United States government. And before joining Trump's campaign in 2016, he was lobbying for the Russian-controlled president of Ukraine and was up to his neck in Russian oligarchs. He owed money to the Russian mafia. Thanks to this pardon from Trump, Manafort was freed from some of his legal problems, and he got to keep many of his extravagant homes scattered throughout New York. Trump is reportedly bringing him back to help out on the 2024 campaign. Why? Loyalty? Or more importantly, Paul Manafort is more unhinged and as even more stupid than Donald Trump because Trump can only surround himself with crazy and stupid. That might be good news for Rudy Giuliani. Nah, there's no good news for Rudy. You know, crazy and stupid, eventually it catches up with you. It just does. It, it's caught up with Rudy. And even if Trump somehow finds his way back into the Oval Office... Crazy and stupid, uh, it's really easy to keep crazy and stupid in check. Uh, but the resistance has to be there. Which brings me back to Ohio's primary on Tuesday. It's important. 
you, you know, you, losing Sherrod Brown in November would be a disaster. It would mean maybe possibly the Democrats losing control of the Senate. Now, the same way Republicans barely control the House of Representatives, Democrats barely control the Senate. 100 senators, 49 of whom are Republican, the Democrats have 48. But three independents caucus with the Democrats. They are Bernie Sanders of Vermont, Angus King of Maine, and Kristen Sinema of Arizona, who was a Democrat until last year, and then she became an independent, but she still caucuses with the Democrats, so that's why the Democrats control uh, the Senate. There's a distinct possibility the Dems are going to take back the House come November. Some are even suggesting with Colorado Republican Ken Buck quitting this month, just walking away from the House, Hakeem Jeffries, the Democratic minority leader, could temporarily become speaker before November. It's an unlikely scenario. But looking at 2025, the Dems stand an awfully good chance of taking back the House after a series of electoral maps were ordered to be redrawn by the courts. Uh, these maps are in Alabama and Louisiana. Uh, Alabama and Louisiana were forced to create two newly heavily black, therefore heavily Democratic, congressional districts. So we should expect two new Democratic members of Congress coming out of Alabama and Louisiana. New York State has also redrawn some maps, and while the maps don't create new districts that automatically favor the Democrats, they have created new districts that tilt Democratic, meaning it's not going to be too difficult to flip a couple of uh, districts in New York from red to blue in November. As for the Senate, Democrats are on defense. They will probably keep Arizona now that Cinema is out and it's a matchup between Congressman Ruben Gallego, a veteran, and Carrie Lake, uh, an election denier who lost her bid for governor in 2022. Her platform, she literally ran on this platform, if I lose, it's because of election fraud. Okay, but what are you going to do for the people of Arizona? Her answer was, if I lose, it's because of election fraud. So I think Ruben Gallego wins Arizona, but that's a push. We already Democrats already have Arizona. We're going to lose a seat in West Virginia. Joe Manchin isn't running for re-election, and his seat is going to flip from blue to red. In Montana, John Tester, who rode the same wave that Ohio Senator Sherrod Brown rode into the Senate back in 2006, he's running for re-election too, and Democrats need to keep that seat. So remember, in an evenly split Senate, and we've seen evenly split Senates before, where the vice president breaks the tie. In an evenly split Senate, the vice president breaks the tie. So the race for president right now is also a race for control of the Senate and, of course, the future of our Supreme Court. ABC News reports that during a campaign speech in Ohio, Donald Trump warned that if he didn't win in November, there would be a bloodbath for the entire country, adding that would be the least of it. Trump's surrogates later clarified that when the president spoke of a bloodbath, he was referring to the auto industry getting clobbered by China if he's not elected president. And 
there's nobody to protect the auto industry. Trump's senior campaign advisor, Jason Miller, took to social media to explain that the Biden White House mandating the switch to electric vehicles would result in American auto companies being put out of business by China flooding our marketplace with cheaper electric cars. Uh, That's what Trump meant by promising a bloodbath, says his top aide, Jason Miller. Jason Miller, you might remember, was Trump's top campaign advisor. Uh, And again, he insists... His candidate was speaking metaphorically when he warned of a bloodbath should Trump lose in November. You might remember Jason Miller worked on Trump's first campaign back in 2016. He was set to become Trump's very first White House communications director until it was revealed Jason Miller, international man of mystery, was cheating on his wife, sleeping with a Trump campaign staffer, who he got pregnant, you know, good Christian right-wing conservative values. Like I said, that affair led to the birth of a child just six months after Miller and his wife had their second daughter. So it was a busy 2017 for Jason Miller. Uh, Two children from two separate women. Miller has been taken to court several times by the mother of his illegitimate child. Can you still call? Is is it proper to say illegitimate? No child is illegitimate, so I'm not going to say that. His bastard. Uh, Miller has been taken to court several times by the mother of his bastard. I'm sorry. Uh, I don't know what you call a child born out of wedlock. But Miller has been taken to court several times by his mistress, who has accused him of refusing to pay support. Uh, Jason Miller ended up suing Splinter News for $100 million after Splinter reported that court records indicate Jason Miller was accused of slipping an abortion pill into another mistress's smoothie after she refused to make a pregnancy disappear. The court ruled in favor of Splinter News. The Trump White House. During several interviews over the past couple of weeks, Donald Trump said that he would pardon most, if not all, of the people who stormed the Capitol on January 6th. He now refers to them as political hostages and often begins his campaign rallies with a recording of the national anthem sung by January Sixers currently held in a Washington, D.C. jail. Over the weekend, Trump said that Liz Cheney, along with all the other members of the January 6th committee, will be arrested when he becomes president. During an interview with Fox News on Sunday, Trump was asked why he refers to the migrants in such Hitlerian terms, like accusing them of poisoning our blood. Trump answered, because they are poisoning our blood. Despite evidence to the contrary, Trump lies and says the migrants are all criminals or inmates from mental institutions. It's not true. He's confusing them with the people who (laughs) worked in his White House. Those are the criminals and escapees from mental institutions. This is just a lie that he's spreading about the migrants. Despite, as the New York Times points out, the, the crime rate is going down in all the major blue cities that have seen an influx of migrants Despite crime rate going down in all the major blue cities that have seen an influx of migrants, Trump keeps insisting these migrants are all criminals, murderers, and of course, the worst of the worst. Last week during a campaign stop in Ohio, the dehumanization 
of the migrants took a turn for the worst when he confessed to the crowd, I know it's not politically correct, but they're all animals. The migrants are animals. And then he added, they're not human. It's unbelievable. And I was wondering how long it would take to go full Hitler and start referring to his political opponents as vermin. Turns out he already has. I forgot. I looked it up. Back on November 11th, Veterans Day, Trump delivered a two-hour Veterans Day speech where he honored the brave men and women who fought on the side of Germany by referring to his political opponents as, quote-unquote, vermin he went after the political left by warning the crowd that he always believed the greatest threat to america is from within this is full bore hitler the enemy is within and he says when he returns to the white house it will be his job to root out the radical left the real enemy he says is not ukraine it's not putin it's the it's the radical left within our own country i mean this is straight out of a nuremberg rally and keep this in mind when you listen to gop isolationists who don't want to assist ukraine Keep this in mind when you hear them talking about leaving NATO. These America firsters, going back to the days of Lindbergh taking on Roosevelt, they were never anti-war. They just didn't want to go to war with Hitler. The same way today, they don't want to go to war with Putin. They're... You know, these so-called men of peace would have no problem going to war with Iran or China. And most importantly, the real war, as Trump points out, is within. They, they, They want to fight a war against the radical left and, of course, the migrants, the vermin who are poisoning our nation's blood. Victor Orban from Hungary refers to Donald Trump as a man of peace because he doesn't want to give arms to Zelensky. Donald Trump, man of peace. I hear Maga Moran say, well, you know, he, he kept us out of war. He was waging war on us. He was waging war on this country most likely in the service of Vladimir Putin. So, uh, talking about vermin and the poisoning of our nation's blood, this is not, as we know, an original playbook. It's a threadbare series of behaviors that include jailing your political enemies as well as deciding who the scapegoat du jour is and rounding them up. Those scapegoats are always the same groups of people. It's the LGBTQ community, people of color, the first people, the indigenous people, women, always women, always immigrants, always the physically and mentally disabled, always the Jews, always the Muslims, always the Arabs, always the leftists and the communists. This isn't just Nazi Germany stuff. The Nazis were able to do it on a scale that was unimaginable. But we've, we're seeing parts of this playbook in Russia right now. Orban's Hungary. Up until recently, we, we saw it in Poland and in Brazil. We see it throughout Central and South America whenever there's a right-wing regime change. Trump's not doing anything that's not been tried before. During an interview Monday on a right-wing radio show, Donald Trump said Jews who vote for Joe Biden or 
the Jews who vote for Democrats, hate Israel, and they hate Judaism. The Biden White House called Trump's remarks, quote, vile and unhinged anti-Semitic rhetoric. After Jewish groups demanded Trump take back those remarks, his campaign refused. They doubled down and said Trump is absolutely right. Jews who vote for Joe Biden hate Israel and hate Judaism. So these are clearly the rantings of a desperate and dangerous man, a man who is starting to realize that he's been exposed as a fraud, especially since the world now knows he cannot find anyone willing to lend him the half a billion dollars he doesn't have to pay a fine leveled against him by the state of New York. He's desperate. He's been exposed. So his, he's going to keep saying crazier and crazier stuff. Now, if you remember last month, New York State Judge Arthur N. Gorin fined Donald Trump nearly half a billion dollars after Trump was found guilty of tricking lenders into giving him favorable interest rates by convincing them he was far wealthier than he actually is. To put it another way, Trump secured hundreds of millions of dollars in loans using collateral he did not have. It's illegal. This civil lawsuit brought by New York State Attorney General Letitia James, it, from the very start, it cut Trump to the quick because it exposed him for what he has always been, a con artist, a charlatan, who spent much of his adult life racking up debt, then declaring bankruptcy, screwing over his creditors, while still presenting himself as a successful businessman in order to con more people into lending him more money so he could service his previous debts before once again declaring bankruptcy. Six times he declared bankruptcy that we know of. Along the way, he picked up extra cash laundering money for Russian oligarchs. There's countless stories of Trump buying a mansion in Florida for $40 million, turning around and selling it for $80 million. That's how you clean up cash for the Russian mafia. But we also know when Trump sees a pile of cash sitting around, he has to dip his beak. Like Paul Manafort, Trump owes money to the Russian mafia. Throughout the New York civil fraud trial, Trump angrily stood outside the courtroom doors, ranting and raving, insisting he was a multi-billionaire and that he ran a very successful business. Now, if that were true, you would keep it to yourself. If you have a successful business, you don't, A, you don't need to tell anybody you're successful because people already know, and you don't want to draw attention to your success because the government will try to tax you more. People who are truly wealthy and successful downplay it. Uh, anyway, Trump angrily uh, held these press conferences outside the courtroom doors. I'm a successful businessman. And he insisted Mar-a-Lago was worth half a billion dollars. And then he would say, maybe even double that. Even though the truth, and I've tried to explain this to some MAGA morons, it just, they refuse to understand this. Mar-a-Lago has been assessed at roughly $30 million because Trump, 
when he bought it, signed a series of contracts with the city of Palm Beach. Palm Beach guaranteed him millions of dollars in tax breaks, uh, and he agreed to sign papers that keep Mar-a-Lago as an historic preservation trust in perpetuity. So Mar-a-Lago is worth half a billion dollars the same way the White House is worth half a billion dollars. Legally, it cannot be listed on Zillow, no matter how hard Trump tries to sell both. Trump would sell the White House if he could, and he would sell Mar-a-Lago if he could. He can't. Numbers do not lie. Donald Trump committed fraud, and the judge, Judge Arthur Ann Gorin, said, come up with half a billion dollars by March 25th, or the Attorney General will seize your properties to pay off this fine. Trump and his attorney, Alina Haba, who famously said it's more important to be pretty than smart, she immediately called the judge's ruling a disgrace. And she said, we're appealing. And Judge Angoran told Trump and his lawyers, you are free to go ahead and appeal my ruling. But this is New York State. And in the state of New York, you have to put that half a billion dollars I just find you into an escrow account. It will either be returned to you or kept by the state of New York, depending on the disposition of the appeals process. Well, that was unacceptable to Trump, so he immediately appealed. Alina Haba went before an appellate judge, and she said, it's impossible for my client to come up with half a billion dollars. Impossible. She said, maybe we can get a $100 million bond. Maybe, she said. The appellate judge said, no, the law is the law. Half a billion dollars by March 25th. And on Monday, once again, Trump said, impossible. I owe the state of New York half a billion dollars. I ain't got it. This is official. He said, I checked with 30 companies and they refused to lend me the money. And right there, when Trump's attorney said he doesn't have half a billion dollars and he cannot find anyone willing to post a uh, half a billion dollar bond, which would probably have to be a billion dollars for reasons I don't want to get into. When they said that, right there, Trump admitted guilt. He lost any chance of a successful appeal of Judge Arthur and Gorin's ruling. The mere fact that nobody will lend Trump half a billion dollars is dispositive proof that Attorney General Letitia James was absolutely correct when she brought the case and Judge Arthur Angoran was absolutely correct when he found Trump guilty of fraud. The only reason banks ever lent him money is because he forged his financials. He never had the collateral. Now, if the judge was wrong that he did have the collateral and, and, and Trump wasn't lying and was telling the truth that he is as wealthy as he insists then he should have had no problem coming up with half a billion dollars in cash or at the very least being able to secure loans using his property as collateral. But Trump doesn't own these properties. He never did own these properties. He borrowed against them 
but he never owned it. It's like somebody renting a house and then taking out a mortgage on a house they don't own. That's basically what Trump has been doing. Forbes magazine, which keeps track of these things, reports that Trump's money, and Forbes is as reliable as the government is when it comes to uncovering Trump's finances. Uh, Forbes magazine has an article, and everybody should read it. it. They report that Trump's money woes from these fines are just be, just the beginning of his money woes. If you read this article in Forbes, you he's broke. He's flat broke, and he's been flat broke for more than a decade. Read the article in Forbes. Uh, no company, no company should post a bond for him unless they expected some kind of favor when he gets back into the Oval Office. According to Forbes, Trump doesn't own any of the buildings. Any of the buildings with his name on them, he doesn't own them. In some cases, he might own a part of the building. In some cases, he owns the retail space. In another, it's just the parking garage. In another building, he owns the land upon which the building stands. He owns a lease for the land. And making matters so much worse. All of what he owe, owns, he owes. He borrowed against all of it. He has borrowed against every single piece of property he owns. According to Forbes, Trump has at least $1 billion in outstanding mortgages. And over the next four years, according to Forbes, $780 million worth of those mortgages start coming due. Well, how, how do you pay off the $780 million? When you don't have it, you take out other loans. Those days are over. Nobody's going to lend him money ever again. It's been reported that he had several hundred million dollars in bonds and cash. Maybe that's true, but it wasn't enough to cover the nearly half a billion dollars in judgments against him. A quick tour of Donald Trump's real estate shows how broke he is. Trump Plaza in New York, for example, the mortgage on that will come due in July. Now, he doesn't own Trump Plaza because it's all condos. He only owns the, real, uh, the retail space, and that's valued at $30 million. But he has a mortgage on that. He took out a $12 million loan against the retail space he's got to pay that back in july he doesn't have it then there's 40 wall street which with trump tower is considered one of the supposed crown jewels in the trump real estate portfolio but he doesn't own 40 wall street he only owns a lease for the ground it's built upon according to forbes <clears throat> the value of the lease is $205 million. In other words, the tenants pay him $20 million a year for use of the land where the tower is built. But he borrowed $121 million against that lease. And he has to pay that $120 million back by July of 2025. And here's where it gets even worse. He cut up that lease and sold off parts of it to investors who wanted a steady stream of income. So he was getting about $20 million a year off that lease. He divided it and sold it to investors. So he borrowed against a lease he didn't even own. Like I said, 
this is the guy <laughs> who rents a house and then you goes and gets a mortgage of a, a property he's renting then there's the trump international hotel that overlooks central park all trump owns there is the retail space and the parking garage and that's worth about 10 million dollars he borrowed against it he borrowed six million dollars against it <clears throat> and that comes due in two years then of course there's trump tower which is all condos he doesn't own trump tower he owns the retail space which is valued at 156 million dollars but he borrowed a hundred million dollars against the retail space and that note is due in a couple of years he barely owns any of these buildings Plus, who knows what the retail space on any of these buildings is really worth? If you walk around Manhattan, retail space is empty. Nobody has the money to buy anything in these stores. Uh, these stores are either closing or they're being kept open just for show uh, to save the neighborhood. The, you know, if... if if you own a building and the retail space is empty, the value of your property goes down. So a lot of these landlords aren't charging <clears throat> rent to these stores. <clears throat> they just, because they need to, to make it look like there's business. Uh, so I doubt there's any cash flow coming in to the Trump organization. And we also have no idea how many silent partners trump has those are you know there's no con this is mafia shit mobsters here in new york city and of course mobsters from russia they're dipping their hand into trump's cash flow before it ever reaches donald trump he is flat broke even worse, he owes money to some really bad people. So, I think he's going to come up with a half a billion dollars. He says he does. <clears throat> he says he doesn't have it. <clears throat> I think somebody will bail him out. I have a poll going in the chat room here on youtube hello everybody thank you i missed everybody Some really bad Let me, uh, people see what the results of the poll is we have if you're watching me live on youtube thank you go to the chat room and uh here's the poll so far we have 2060 votes will trump come up with half a billion dollars by march 25th and your choice is, <clears throat> unfortunately, yes or no, his luck has finally run out. Uh, I'll give you one more minute if you want to participate in the poll. This is a, it's good to be back. Anytime Trump is suffering, uh, I'm always happy to be doing this show. Okay, I'm going to end the poll. Will Trump come up with half a billion dollars by March 25th? 29% of uh, 2,100 votes, 29% say yes, he will come up with it. And 71% disagree with me and say his luck has finally run out. Interesting. Okay. We will find out on Monday, on the 25th. He says he doesn't have the half a billion dollars. I think, he, I think some angel will bail him out. But if it doesn't happen <clears throat> come Monday, there's going to be a padlock on Trump Tower. Letitia James, she destroyed the National Rifle Association last month. She's going to destroy the Trump organization 
this month. I'm David Feldman reminding you to stay strong and protect the weak. Thank you. It's good to be back.